Hi everyone, I'm Russell Leidick and you are watching the Dangerous Fishbowl channel. This is Forest Bubble, my latest eco-aquarium composition. In this video, I'll explain its engineering evolution in detail. If you want to learn about the plants and animals inside it, check out the one entitled Forest Bubble Flora and Fauna, or for a long, uncut series of five-minute clips, see Forest Bubble Long View. Let's get started. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for helping to propel the eco-aquarium concept into the public consciousness through your analysis and discussions surrounding the Jungle Bubble video, which was my first serious attempt at creating a fishbowl which manages itself. I subsequently tried to define the concept more precisely in Introduction to the Eco-Aquarium, which is also available on this channel. There were a number of flaws in the Jungle Bubble design, as I discussed at length in Rethinking Jungle Bubble. Without repeating them here, suffice to say that I've gone to great lengths to improve upon the original concept. For starters, I got rid of the need for CO2, or any artificial fertilizer for that matter. And as you can see, the fish are tiny ember tetras quite at home in this giant bowl with a diameter of about 45 centimeters and a capacity of about 45 liters. By the way, I'll provide information in the description on where to get all the materials required to build your own. The bowl is made of acrylic, which is much stronger than glass and therefore much safer. It's only a few millimeters thick, but I banged into it once by mistake and it survived unscathed. As you can see, there's a tiny seam at the equator due to the manufacturing process. But otherwise, it's very smooth and transmits more light than a glass fishbowl would. The only downside is that it scratches very easily. So you need to be paranoid about getting grains of sand in the sponges and towels that you use for cleaning. I keep a dedicated soft cloth just for this purpose. I also use a felt furniture slider called a super slider to clean tough green spot algae from the inside surface. Whatever you use to scrub the bowl, do so in an invisible area first. And by all means, exercise caution when using metal plant trimming tools, which can easily nick the surface. If you do damage the exterior, you might want to check out the video on acrylic repair linked in the description. The top, as you can see, is also acrylic. It's 3 8 inches thick and offset from the lip of the bowl by soft acrylic bumpers. This facilitates gas exchange as well as clearance for the cord leading to the power head. The power head itself is an inexpensive 90 gallon per hour unit. You can't see it too well here but I super glued an extra suction cup to the cord so as to prevent it from hanging into the water column. It does require unclogging every week or so. In order to do that, you will need to carefully slide it up to the lip of the bowl, moving along the inside wall. Do not pull on the suction cups. Otherwise, your arm might suddenly jolt across the bowl, destroying everything in sight. The cord is held in place by a spine made of foam cable stays called D-wings. I suppose you could put the last one at the equator and just drop the cord vertically from there. In this case, I've continued the spine all the way to the base. The white plastic pipe is a four inch female adapter, which is wide enough to be stable and also has a bevel on its inside circumference so as to alleviate pressure points on the bowl. After all, it needs to support more than 50 kilograms with a very small contact area. By the way, I recently learned that there's something called a repair coupling. It has better aesthetics and might fit the purpose as well. The adapter is caulked to another acrylic disc. I was very careful to keep the thickness of the caulk uniform so as to avoid tilting the bowl. After it dried, I applied an additional amount around the outside in order to exclude water from the interior of the adapter. And finally, this disc is underlaid by a cork mat of exactly the same radius. The reason is, again, to exclude water. We don't want it leaking between the layers or between the rubber backing of the cork mat and the surface of the table underneath. Something you cannot see is that the driftwood is caulked to the base of the bowl. This is mandatory unless you want to spend months or even years attempting to waterlog it. Oh, and don't forget to clean it and dry it first. You also need to use a lot of caulk in order to ensure structural integrity. And definitely wear latex gloves and a respirator because it's messy and somewhat of a toxic task. If possible, lean the driftwood against the side of the bowl for extra support. And bear in mind, it will probably get banged during cleaning from time to time. Take care not to splatter the caulk on the visible part of the bowl, which can be a pain to remove. I let the caulk dry for at least 48 hours before proceeding, because it's never going to get another chance to do so. 
You might then test the structural integrity of the driftwood and reinforce with additional caulk if necessary. Super glue might work as well, but I've never tried it. The substrate, as usual, is pool sand. Don't forget that it's an inhalation hazard when dry, so wear a respirator and pour it out underwater. If you plan on planting rooted plants or growing them from seeds, you should do that while there's a shallow puddle of water covering the sand. You could put some natural fertilizer near the roots as well, although I don't recommend installing an entire layer of soil as it's easily kicked into the water column. Before filling the rest of the bowl with water, I attached various mosses and anubias to the driftwood with superglue. I learned this technique from Rachel O'Leary's channel. Once again, you want to be wearing latex gloves and a respirator as the fumes have only one way to escape, which is directly into your face as you rearrange the plants. Take care too, not to splatter the superglue super all over the driftwood or worse, on the bowl. It's still not time to fill the bowl. Get a spray bottle and spray mist all over the plants that you just attached or even one by one after attaching each of them. This mist will help the superglue solidify because unlike normal glue, it actually requires water to do so. This will also prevent the plants from dehydrating during the aquascaping process. If you like, use plant tongs to position your plants but remember that they can severely scratch your acrylic. Finally, make sure that your bonds are strong enough to withstand buffeting from water currents, because once the fish are in place, superglue cannot be used. Now, finally, fill the bowl, leaving a few centimeters of air at the top, because we want to allow for further maintenance without causing an overflow. It's also a good idea to refrain from maximum filling in any event, because the surface area to volume ratio of a spherical bowl is quite low and we want to provide for sufficient gas exchange. The first time you fill the bowl, you may find bits of sand and super glue at the surface. Use a plastic cup, such as a yogurt cup, to skim off this material. The surface must be clear of debris in order to support your fish. Having filled the bowl, I then installed the power head. Well, actually not just yet. I first super glued that extra suction cup to the side of the cord facing the inner wall of the bowl. This allowed me to affix the cord to the wall so as to prevent it from dangling into the water column and creating a hazard. I then placed the power head itself at the equator, such that the water jet runs exactly parallel to the floor. This is critically important because otherwise you'll end up with poor water circulation and or excessive debris in the water. If the flow is still too strong, you can place it behind the driftwood like I have. Personally, I like to fold the cord behind the power head so that the jet is at the top instead of the bottom. However, this makes the suction cups less effective, so I don't recommend doing so. Finally, note that the cord needs to be sort of massaged into the shape of the external spine. In particular, I had to create a fold at the point where it intersects the lip of the bowl so that it would not push open the lid. When you first start your bowl, it's a good idea to cycle it for a week or more prior to adding fish. And when you do add fish, add only a few at a time because, again, you're fighting a very low surface area. So I recommend suitable nano fish, such as the tiny ember tetras in forest bubble. During the cycling period, you're going to need a source of ammonia and trace minerals to nourish the plants. Some of this will come from the soil fertilizer. Optionally, you can add one milliliter of urine per one liter of water. Yeah, seriously, you cannot get cheaper than that. Too much and your plants will die. Too little and they won't grow. But most definitely, your ammonia needs to be indetectable before you add fish. And if it's not obvious, urine and fish don't belong in the same aquarium. There's another hazard to be aware of, which is especially important in a bowl. It's what I call cascading death syndrome. It works like this. One fish dies for whatever reason. Then its decay causes an ammonia spike. The ammonia causes another fish to die, and so on. The fish die at an accelerating rate. This is why it's so important to ensure that you have enough plants to mitigate the ammonia supply as rapidly as possible, and few enough fish to prevent this runaway process from occurring in the first place. And again, make sure to leave enough of an air gap at the top of the bowl so that your surface area is not too small. I also provide 12 hours of light, just like in the wild, in order to sustain the plant's oxygen production and appetite for waste products. Above all, if you see your fish gathered at the surface, you have a serious water quality problem, which requires an immediate water change. In that case, more than likely, a fish has died and the ammonia level has risen drastically. 
This occurs more often in the morning because the plants are not as biologically active in the dark. Speaking of light, the entire setup is illuminated by an IKEA Arad floor lamp with a 1300 lumen, 5000 Kelvin, that means daylight, PAR38 LED bulb. Now, trust me on this, you don't want to put the light source too close to the acrylic, as even LED lamps with that kind of power can get quite hot. It's not just a fish hazard, it's a fire hazard. So keep at least 10 centimeters of separation and make sure that the lamp isn't going to slide out of position and onto the bowl. Given the geometry of this sort of aquarium, it's important to alter the lighting angle just as the sun moves across the sky. Otherwise, you won't get optimal plant growth and some plants might not grow at all. I usually do one angle in the morning and another in the evening. I suppose it would also be possible to alternate once a day. It makes for impressive scenery variations as well. As far as maintenance is concerned, all I really do is trim the plants and especially the ones hogging all the light at the surface. For that matter, I choose plants such as Cryptocorni balance, which is that tall spiral plant you see here. The reason is that I want plants that sort of grow all over the water column as opposed to all over the surface. Vallisneria, for example, would not make a good bowl plant. When I trim the plants, I also unclog the filter. Don't forget to unplug it first, of course. I also use that furniture slider I mentioned to remove pesky green spot algae from the inside of the bowl. The water always smells clean, never foul, but I change it anyway because over time it evolves a tea coloration due to the tannins which leach from the driftwood. The fish like it, but I don't. By the way, in order to avoid fish stress, make sure not to change more than 75% of the water and ideally not more than 50%. In bowls like this, and Ecoquaria generally, it can take as much as a few days for the debris to settle out of the water column after a water change. So don't be discouraged if your water actually looks worse after the fact. Just don't forget the dechlorinator. So that's the engineering story. But why have I bothered to do this at all? The reason is that, thanks in part to viewers like you, I've come to understand that two major disruptive trends are evolving around the freshwater environment. The first of these is the obvious environmental destruction, and in particular, the spoiling of natural freshwater supplies, which is occurring with accelerating frequency. It's ironic that while the aquarium industry has suffered declining popularity over the past few decades, its relevance as a connection to nature and a safe harbor for endangered species has grown substantially. So I think it's not merely desirable, but in fact necessary, that we as a society evolve more efficient ways of bringing the wild aquascape into our homes. The second disruption is a slow but steady shift towards smaller aquaria. This is evinced by the rise in the popularity of nanotanks, as well as small ecoquaria such as forest bubble. I think it reflects a growing need to minimize the economic and environmental toll of fish keeping itself, which is a good thing. But it also promises to facilitate a more ubiquitous domestication of the freshwater environment. This will become absolutely necessary if we are to maintain even a vague approximation of our natural heritage in a future increasingly defined by virtual worlds and engineered infrastructure. So think of Forest Bubble as a seed from which to grow your own ideas about how to bring nature into your home in a manner which is economically and environmentally sustainable. And yet, the aesthetics and moreover the opportunity for introspection and learning are unmatched by any technology which we might ever hope to create. I hope that Forest Bubble has inspired you to dream of a river or a lake or an ocean right there in your own room, in the midst of this grand artificial construct which we call civilization, so that we might never forget that we too are part of nature. Thank you for listening.